I'm going to go to Acts chapter 10, the book of Action chapter 10, and I'm going to read just four verses in your hearing. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through verse 4. When you get into your Bible or your smart device, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. It'll be the last time I ask you to stand tonight. Uh, but if you would share that with me. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 4, and it says this. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his, what, house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Cornelius saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him Cornelius and when he looked on him he was afraid and said what is it Lord and he said unto him thy prayers and thy giving has come up before God as a memorial and all of God's people said amen on your way to your seat, speak this to the person in this atmosphere, to the person near you, tell them it's coming to the house. It's coming to the house. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. As you may have heard in my bio, I have this passion when it comes to history. Probably one of my favorite eras of American history is probably the Civil War period. Um, the, t the tension of it, the, the multiple layers of the Civil War, the impact that it has even on how our country is shaped to this day. So that's why it's very easy when, for me when it comes to the scriptures uh, to find myself consumed in the narrative of the Torah. You know, we get a front row seat to what the scripture calls the chosen people of Abraham of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, for me to even say that in, in this day and hour, for some people can be problematic because oftentimes in our present generation, our theology is often shaped by Facebook timelines instead of scriptures we read. I still say that the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are God's chosen people because the Bible says it. Now, some people would say to me, well, they're not perfect and they have issues. Well, Jesus would agree with you. <laughs> Moses would agree with you when he says they're stiff-necked. <laughs> they're rebellious. So why is it important for me to still yet acknowledge the chosenness, not necessarily special, but chosen? Because me having a front row seat to them and they being called chosen after backsliding, after being in denial, speaks to me that I haven't messed up so bad that God can't use me. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I'm not innocent, but I am still chosen. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, we celebrated the fact Sunday that we're saved, but being saved and being innocent ain't always the same thing. I got some stuff with me, but you can't take away the fact that my identity is that I am chosen by God. Hallelujah. And so... I love the books of history of the Old Testament, the narrative of the children of Israel, their journey and possessing the promised land by dispossessing a people. Shows us that God is not just a promise maker, but God is also a promise keeper. But when we come into the new covenant, this dispensation of grace, and we look at the categories of the New Testament scriptures, we have one book of history. And it's not necessarily the history of an ethnic group. 
as much as the history of an organism, a living and breathing organism. It's called the ecclesia. The church. Glory be to God. It was after his passion. Hallelujah. After he suffered. We just finished shouting about it on Sunday. That on the third day, he got up. But oftentimes when we talk about Jesus getting up, sometimes in our cliff note preaching, we go straight from his resurrection to his ascension. But there's something between his uh, resurrection and his ascension. There's a period of 40 days which can be symbolic uh, to 40 and other places in the scripture with numerological uh, references. 40 meaning the end of a cycle. My God, I feel like hollering in here. I need you to tell your neighbor the season you're in is not forever. My God. After, hallelujah, after resurrection, he could have went straight to ascension. But he hung around for 40 days, the scripture saying, giving the disciples infallible proofs. Glory be to God. I need you to lay your hands on your neighbor and tell your neighbor, remember this season. Remember the season when you get one prophecy after another. Remember the season when you get one dream, one vision, one confirmation. Because there comes hours in your future where God will lure you in with the prophecy and drop you off into a process. And you have to rehearse what you heard in the beginning. Hallelujah. God giving you proof is really God proving you. Here's Jesus, hallelujah, walking through closed doors, hallelujah. Not intimidated by Thomas's fear or doubt. He says, I'm taking my time with y'all because I'm laying a foundation in you. Aren't you glad that God took the time to lay a foundation in you? Some of y'all were jealous and upset because it seemed like some people were going faster than you and some people were accelerating quicker than you and some people were building bigger than you. But aren't you glad, my God, that what you thought was rejection was really God preserving you? Y'all not praying. Aren't you glad that somebody sat you down? Aren't you glad that somebody held you back? Uh, I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I thank God for every rebuke. I thank God for every correction. See, some of y'all saying it, but you don't mean it. I praise God in this hour for all the moments I thought I was looked over. He, he took the time to lay a foundation in me. I'll never get one time I was talking to Bishop Kenneth Moe Sr. God bless his memory. He said to me one time, he says, don't build a church unless you have to. He said, don't do it. He said, take a building, renovate it, but don't build a church unless you have to. I said, well, Bishop, you building the biggest church in Bridgeport. He said, exactly. Don't build a church. Unless you have to. He says, because you lose things in the process. He says, I have members who have been loyal members begin to question me concerning the money. He said, because when you're building, everything comes, come, it starts to center around the building. And he says, so what if my uh, good child is asking me, he says, where's the money going? We raising money and we've been raising this money for this building fund and I don't see no building. Bishop Moe said, get in the car with me. He said, he took the man down there to the site and he pointed to that hole. He said, you see that hole right there? That's where your money is going. He says, if we were building a house, we would be somewhere different in the process. He said, but because we're building something big, it's taking time just to lay the foundation. My God, I come to tell about 50 people that will praise him. You're about to find out why it took so long. God says, you haven't been denied. You haven't been overlooked. Scream at somebody. Tell them we're building.
building. We're building. Find somebody from your church and tell them we're building. We're not in competition with nobody. I'm not mad at nobody that gets there before me because I know the stage I'm in. He's laying a foundation in us. Stop frustrating your marriage trying to compete with people that ain't even looking your direction. Build the foundation. And so for 40 days, Jesus is speaking to them concerning the kingdom. He's laying a foundation. Because he says, upon this rock, upon the revelation of who I am, glory be to God, I'm going to build my ecclesia. (laughs) Not church in our English sense, concerning a building he says I'm going to build a people and that's why I have an issue with people who want to do ministry but they can't do people I have an issue with people who can speak to bishop but they can't speak to the people they're supposed to serve oh my god hallelujah You can't do ministry if you're not willing to do people because the ecclesia, God says, I'm not trying to build a platform for you. I want to tell somebody in this room, you're not going to use God to get your glory. God going to use you to get his glory. Forty days of laying a foundation, speaking of things concerning the kingdom. Then he tells them, go to Jerusalem. Go there and stay there until I endow you with power from on high. And he says to them in Acts 1 and 8, after. Hit it. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you should have dunamis. You have power. Now listen what he says this power is for. Not for your presentation. He says, power to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's why every church should be able to map out their Jerusalem. Because it's a sad thing if you're reaching people across the world, but you're skipping over your Jerusalem. You need to map out your Judea. Because if you're only reaching to the people in your church, if you're just a church to your members and not a church to your community, then you missed your assignment. Why did God put you in the neighborhood? Oh, y'all, they got title men here. Why did God put you on the street? He put you in. Does the street know you're here? Hear me? You got to be able to map out your sphere of influence. Your assignment, because that's what the Holy Ghost does. He says, go to Jerusalem. Now, I've given you this assignment, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. But you do that after. After the Holy Ghost has come. Well, in other words, he says, you you just had Passover. But I want you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, we can't leave people at Passover. Tell them we got to get them to Pentecost. No, we can't leave people at just the confession of your faith. We got to get them to Pentecost. We just can't leave people in new members class. And they know how the church works. But they're not acquainted with a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Y'all talk to me up here. Y'all hear me? Y'all know me? We got to get people to Pentecost because something has happened in the transition of the tapestry of church that it's possible to join a Pentecostal church and never have a Pentecostal experience. And this is why we got to cancel you every week. And this is why we got to have all of these meetings. Sometimes you need to shut down the meeting and have a prayer meeting. Because some of these people we have placed in position because of their skill and they don't have the Holy Ghost. Oh, y'all just shut down. I got to preach it like I feel it tonight. Don't leave people at Passover. Tell you they will get them to Pentecost.
because because now everybody dances I don't care what denominational background everybody dance. Anglican people are dancing people have learned the expression of Pentecost so people got an expression but have you had an experience oh I need you to ask your neighbor ask him have you received since you believe ask him ask him ask them ask them the question now, now I need you to answer somebody ask them, what day of the week did you receive I don't know well, I got I didn't ask you when you joined the church I didn't ask you when you got the certificate I didn't ask you when he shook the preacher's right hand come on this is convocation I'm asking you when did you have an authentic undeniable experience the reason why we got a generation walking from the faith is because they never got planted in the faith now our children are in children's church 24 7 and they never get to cry on the altar Yeah, I got children's church, so any of y'all pastors got children's church. I'm not against children's church, but at some time you got to empty it out. Oh. You got to empty it out because some of them been in children's church so long with puppets and clowns and coloring books that now they feel like it's invasive for you to pull them out. But when we were children, the reason why we still in the state is because we had the tears. Hallelujah. We didn't understand all the Greek. We didn't understand all the Hebrew, but we kept listening until we could start finishing the line of the preacher. We kept listening. We start counting how many hallelujahs the saints were saying until the hallelujah got in our spirit. I need you to grab somebody by the hand Tell them God laid a foundation in me Y'all call me spooky Y'all call me mystical But I don't apologize You call me just being churchy But I got to live like this Because anytime I try to live in your balance I fall on the other side Push your neighbor, tell your neighbor God did this to me I won't deny it I thank God for what I feel I need about 200 of y'all That had a Holy Ghost experience To open up your mouth And praise him for the day he filled you Praise him for the day he baptized Praise him for the day he slew you in the spirit Praise him Please be seated We can't leave them at Passover We've got to get them to Pentecost because we don't realize some of us no longer have armies we have daycares and everybody got to be handled like a fragile egg for my shot but hear me saints the Holy Spirit is coming in this hour in a fresh new way to bring revival to the saints because we've been sedated whoosh we've been sedated Daniel 7 and 25 is happening among us where the Bible says the evil one has come among us to wear out the saints come on the reason why we don't confront some stuff now because we're tired be honest with me I don't want another meeting after a while you said let folk do what they want to do go to hell if you want to come on at some point you just get frustrated and if you don't stay sober you'll end up going to hell fooling with other folk y'all not talking to me you end up sedating your own self with the stuff you're hearing Somebody shout, get sober, get sober. There's another wind coming. Oh, son, da, 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 ka. I need some prophetic people in this room. Send word down your tell them there's another wind. There's another wind coming. I feel it in my spirit. Hey, I, come on, I see some prophetic people. Talk to the people in your section. Tell them, snap out of it. Don't you get in your head. Don't you get in your emotions. There's another wind coming. I, I, I can declare to you that God is about to flip the capital upside down. That's getting ready to be an outpouring like we've never seen before. I need somebody in this room to shout for the revival that's about to hit your church. Shout for the revival that's about to hit your city. Shout. Make an announcement. Let your shout be an announcement. I gotta go. Okay, I'm past my... 
Let me. The Holy Ghost falls and they experience not just what we would call glossolalia, they experience something called xenoglossy, where these tongues are not the tongues that we hear Apostle Paul talks about in the book of Corinthians. Because Apostle Paul is saying in the book of Corinthians, when these people are talking to God, it doesn't need to be interpreted. Nobody needs to know what they're saying because they're talking to God. But these tongues in Acts chapter 2 seem to be more evangelistic. But don't allow the multilingual culture of Acts chapter 2 cause you to think that this is a melting pot of different religions or a different people group. All of these people were Jews. They came to Jerusalem for the feast. They were a part of the Jewish diaspora. They were coming from all of the known world for the pilgrimage of the feast. So they now speak the languages of the place they came from. And although we don't all speak the same language, they say we all worship in the same God and some things are just understood. And I miss that about the old church. We ain't getting everything from the old church, but I do miss it. I miss the way the saints had a witness. That we didn't have to know each other. We didn't have to go to the same church. But we were sent in the room, in the sanctuary. And that was before the days of laptops and click tracks. We would just sit there and somebody would turn and then the other person, oh my God, I need to know this. Anybody in here other than me, you still get a quickening in your spirit. It ain't Tourette's. Every once in a while, I can I get a little I get a witness in my shot. I get a witness in my spirit that I still belong to God. And sometimes that witness has come at some very inconvenient times. There were times I just finished sinning and I had a quickening. My God. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I still belong to God. Because I thought the Holy Ghost was a reward for my righteousness. Until I found out in Romans chapter 8, it says the spirit helps my weaknesses. So all of you who are in this room asking me, well, do I need to speak in tongue? My answer to you, not unless you're weak. If you're not weak and if you have no weaknesses, if you have no infirmities, if you can do this assignment without God, no, you don't need to speak in tongue. But if people have a way of trying to ride your nerves and trigger you with something else want to come out of your mouth, you need them. He come out of the If your anointing attracts opposition, tell your neighbor, you need the tongues. You need the tongue. I know y'all like all these sliding shoes, but when you go to war, you need some boots that got a tongue. My car, you need something you can strap. Sometimes you see something past you, you gotta be like, So hear me. So these were Jews of the diaspora. The Holy Ghost comes, and now they are hearing the gospel preached in their own language. But they were Jews from different nations, but they were Jews. But the Bible tells us it will come to the Jew first. But then we go from Acts chapter 2, hallelujah, to Acts chapter 8. And we get to chap Acts chapter 8. We see Philip ministering to the Samaritans. Samaritans, what some Bible scholars would say in modern coin phrases, mixed breed. This is a people group who once they were in exile... They, Jew, they were Jews who mixed with other people groups and they even changed their theology. They said, we are, we, we're not going to even worship in Jerusalem. We will worship over here on Mount Jezreel. You know, the Samaritan woman, the woman, y'all remember she asked Jesus like, well, well you know, you, we know you're not supposed to hang with us, but well, you said we should worship. Jesus said, you know, it ain't even about geography. 
the time is coming and now is. I come to tell y'all that something that was coming, it now is. <laughs> Where the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so the Bible says now Paul Philip has great response from the people among the Samaritans. Revival broke out. So we see revival taking place with the Jews. And now the mixed ones. The Samaritans. And now Peter is in a coastal community called Joppa. We know Joppa because Joppa uh, has a tendency to be connected to prophetic voices. We know Jonah and his relationship with Joppa. Huh. Why he's there in Joppa ministering and having great fellowship with his Jewish friends. Glory be to God. All of a sudden while he's on top of a roof just trying to catch his breath. Hear me in the Holy Ghost. Because some of you been looking for an escape. You don't want to quit, but you do want to catch your breath. And isn't it something anybody other than me, you've ever tried to get away from your assignment and you end up running into it? You on vacation and you end up prophesying to somebody? You trying to be carnal and it always makes a turn? <laughs> <laughs> and the Bible says why he's there God takes him into a trance like state and see this has, been, this has been my prayer seriously in my church you know this I've been praying this Lord give our generation their own experiences like after a while you're not going to be able to live off of the testimonies of past generations and this, and this is why your God experience cannot be limited to a church service. How deep can you press in by yourself? Oh, hey, because if you get alone with God, come on, y'all talk to me here. I said, come on, I need some prayer warriors to know what I'm talking about. If you really get alone with God, time will begin to lapse. Have you ever went into the spirit and start praying and when you came out, you was there for two hours and thought you were there for 15 minutes? He'll show you some things. I started this church 19 years ago this week. And I'll never forget when I first started, I went with another college student, German Tanker. His grandmother died. I took him to the funeral in Raleigh, North Carolina. And after the funeral, there was a repast at the house. And I was sitting in one of those funeral chairs and I saw this sweet mother sitting right there. And, and I said, how you doing, mother? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. She says, she said, I see a whole lot of people around you in the spirit. I said, well, and she said that, but Tommy had them in a little storefront church. She said, I see a lot of people around you. She said, but son, you better pray the prayer. Pray it every day. Ask God to cause their hearts to speak. She said, because there are going to be days where it's going to be confusing for you. She said, but when you pray that prayer, Lord, let their heart speak. She said, people are going to say what they're thinking without meaning. I've been praying that prayer. I've had people to open up their mouth and tell me, you know, I'm jealous of you. You know, I really didn't like you. I've had people to let me tell you something. When you get in the spirit, God will start revealing stuff to you. Because in your flesh, you will miss it. You will mislabel people in your flesh. You'll start calling your friends your enemies and calling your enemies your friends. But tell your neighbor, God will reveal. God, when you get in the spirit, come out of some of them cliques. Get up, come out of that group. Get out of that gossiping group. They call themselves intercessors. When you start praying, God will reveal. I need you to look at the people in your section and tell them, God is going to reveal. God is not going to let you take all of those liabilities to the next season of your life. God is about to bring assets. Shout somebody to somebody. Tell them, God will reveal. Let me wrap this up. He's in a trance and God shows him all of these animals. You all Bible teachers, you know this. Of clean and unclean animals. And the Lord told him, slay and eat. He said, uh-uh, I can't do that. Ain't that something? We can get so consumed in our religious construct that we will even tell God no. 
that God can be shifting you in another direction. But you start telling God no. Now, this text is not about our permission to eat bacon. <laughs> this is why we need proper dream translators in the church. Because the person you dreamed about may be a symbol or a representation of something or someone else. And all of your dreams that's in your soulish realm did not come from God. I don't care that you dreamed about him. God is not giving you somebody else's husband. Soulish dreams. Praying soulish prayers. And then you manifesting them and now you think it's a confirmation. That's why you got to protect your ear gates. You can't be a prophet and then sit among a whole bunch of conversations. Because now we can't trust your prophetic. Mm. God was preparing him. Because what was happening? At the same time, there is a Gentile man by the name of Cornelius. This is Caesarea. He's praying. He is a good man. He's a prominent man. He's, he got money. He has maids. He got servants. He has a military prowess. He's in the Roman military in an Italian regiment. But hear me. Pastors, don't let people join your churches and make them feel they're okay as long as they're tithing. And just because they work at Wells Fargo don't mean they got the grace to work in church finances. Just because you're a school teacher, it don't make your Christian education instruction in the house. It's a whole different, tell it's a whole different grace. And Cornelius is praying. He's praying in the house. He's a good man. But the Lord begins to reveal to him that there's more. I, I, I'm, I'm sending something else to you. And I want to release this prophetic word for the people in this house. And this is what I hear the Lord said as I was preparing to come here uh, tonight. The Lord says there's a turning in our churches. And all of us can feel it. All of us prophetically, we can feel that we're in the, it's already turning, but we're like in the middle of a, of a turn. That's a change in leadership. No, really it is. And it's, it's not just hard for them, it's hard for us. Because we like the comfort of knowing, and we made such an impartation in certain people. But anything you hold on to past this season will turn on you. And some of those people were not demons. It's because we lack the discernment when to release them. Tell your neighbor there's a turning. There's a turning. And anyone who is secure in who they are in God. You will give your leader permission to replace you. Because some of us have been in place so long, instead of being a door to the future of the church, we have become a wall. And now, out of your insecurity, you try to assassinate the character of anybody who has potential to do it better than you. And now you are using your insecurity and now you are disguising it with the prophetic. Talk about something just don't sit right with my spirit about them. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor because of where God has taken us. Everyone we need has not gotten to the house yet.
And I want you to practice it, even if it ain't your, even, I don't want you to lie, I want you to prophesy, I don't want you to practice. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I don't have to die in this position. I'm okay, if somebody can do it better, let them do it. This is not my identity, this is how I serve, this is not who I am. Come on, tell your pastor, I give you permission. Replace me. I want the church to grow. I want the, if, and if the next person don't come, I can't go where God has me. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, there's a turning happening in our church. Come on, tell them there's a change in leadership. Come on, tell somebody there's a change in leadership. Come on, tell them there's a change in leadership. I'm okay if I'm not over it. And some of you, your heart is going to be exposed when you're not over it. Because some of you can't serve it unless you're over it. Thank y'all for letting me come. I hope, you know. Ask your neighbor, can you serve it if you're not over it? There's a turning. And this is what I hear the Lord says. There's an expansion of vision. He's moving our vision out of a silo form into an expanded form. And some of us are afraid of that because we start off with these visions for our music ministry. We start off with our visions for our churches. And so then we, we get married to it. And I want you to know, it's going to be everything God showed you, but it may not look the way you thought it was going to look. And it may not be with the people you thought, oh my God. God is giving you expanded vision. Now as you go with this vision, God says, I want to unpack it. You, you had fallen in love with what you thought it was going to be. Hear me. The Lord told me there's going to be a shift in our systems. But make sure when you create these new systems, these new systems do not eradicate the Holy Ghost. I need you to look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, we must be open to what and who God is sending. Oh, come on, look at somebody else. Tell them you got to be open to what and to who God is sending. And I know it's hard because some of us have been triggered because there have been people who've come into our lives in times past and they said all the right things. And then you look in the church, they are no longer here. And they took your secrets and made up the ones they didn't have. Y'all not sending them in here. But I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, God is going to bring people into your life. That's going to make up for what they did. My, I come to prophesy to some people in this room. You sold into one person, but you're going to reap from another. As a matter of fact, God is going to bring people into your life. They don't want nothing much, no more from you. They're not going to put no mandate on you. They're going to come to church on Sunday and receive. But the way they sow back into you is going to be a harvest to make up for the last three years where you help people with no return. Hear me. So Cornelius, he was charitable. But it does not mean he had everything he needed. So he sends the servants. Go. God show him. Go to Peter. Find Peter. He's down in Joppa. Mm. Go find him. He's down in Joppa. And we know the story. You know what happens. Peter gets there. And he starts preaching Jesus. And the Holy Ghost falls. And the Holy Ghost falls on the house. And they began to speak in tongues. This is why, and it was important that they spoke in tongues. I'm going to tell you why. It had nothing to do with their weakness. It was a witness. Because Peter needed to know that the Holy Ghost that the Gentiles had was not an off-brand. Same Holy Ghost. I want you to get ready because God is about to send another group in your church. They not going to look like y'all. They may not. Act, they may be unchurched. Hallelujah. But tell your neighbor, it's going to be the same Holy Ghost. As a matter of fact, I'm tired of all these transplant people. Give me some folk that don't know protocol or who to call, but they want Jesus. Is there anybody in this room? You just want Jesus. I done did church all my life. I want Jesus. I want Jesus. 
So what's happening is I close. For real, I'm closing now. But this is what happens. So the Lord began to speak to me. Lord began to speak to me. He says, it's time for the Gentile church to take it back to the house. It's coming to the house. Our church history is not Solomon's porch. It's not the upper room. I mean, we, can tr- we trace it there. But that's not where our history begins. It happens in the house of Cornelius. And the Lord told me to tell you on this first night of Holy Convocation that many of us have become idols. We've built idols to ministry. While our houses lie in waste. And God said, I never wanted you to be successful in ministry at the expense of your family. Oh, your Messiah, we made an idol. We as musicians and singers, we have started worshiping worship. It's all about you can't press in if it don't sound right. You don't feel God unless it's the right singer. To the point we were employing people to come do it that don't have our spirit. And we become their boss and never their pastor. Oh, y'all just shut down on me, but I know what the Holy Ghost told me to say in this room. God says, I want to take it back. I want to take it back to the house. Because now, because we've been so overexposed to other people's lives. Now, instead of serving God, we serve in money. Now, now you and your husband were good until you looked on social media and saw somebody cut the ribbon to a new house. Now you're going to frustrate your marriage. You're going to frustrate your spouse. You're going to make them feel less until they can make something else happen for you. It's a gross underbelly that has a hole that can't be filled. And God told me, hey, that I'm bringing a revival. Mm, But it's coming to the house. Mm. No more. If we're going to have real healthy churches, healthy churches going to have to be made up of healthy families. This is convocation. Y'all talk to me in here. Healthy families need to be made up of healthy marriages. We've got to bring a level of accountability to our elders again. We got to bring a level of accountability to our deacons. I know y'all getting ready for ordination this week, but before you get ordained, somebody needs to speak to your spouse. Because a collar around your neck and you not sleeping in the same bed is not a good testimony. The enemy has brought a spirit of perversion in the church where married people don't want to have sex and single people just want to fornicate. That is a backwards culture. Tell your neighbor, it's coming to the house. 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 God says, I want to bring a spirit of revival to the house. I want to show you what revival looks like. And revival is not about choirs. Revival is not about preachers. Revival is when the love is spread abroad in the house that your children begin to believe. Y'all know why I believe this thing? I had, I've had, good, I had a good pastor growing up. But the reason why I believe in this because I would come home and I would be in my room playing and I would hear my mother talking and I said, oh, Papa here. And I would jump up because I loved my Papa and I would run out on the porch to see Papa and it would be my mother standing on the back porch turning toward the woods and I said, Lord, bless us, Lord. Make a way. And Lord, I'm just asking you to open up a door. And I said, oh, she prayed. And then I would go in her room sometime and she'd be on her knees going, I was about to and I would try to mimic her and try to pray to her and I would go <laughs> because if I only saw her do that at church I would think that's just something you do when you go there 
But tell your neighbor, it's coming to the house. Oh my God. It's coming to the house. God said he wants us to consecrate our houses again. Because as a porter, you wondering how the spirit of perversion is going on in your house among your kids. And your kids are young and they're struggling with perversion. It's because you open up a portal of pornography in your house. And God, you come on, Shaka. And God, you get on the God said it's time to bring the power back to the house. I want you to get out of your seat and tell somebody, get your oil back on the mantle. Get your holy oil back on the mantle. Get your holy oil back on the mantle. Start anointing your doors again. Start anointing the bedposts again. Oh, I said it's coming to the house. I said it's coming to the house. God is raising up a standard in the house. Pull on your neighbor, tell your neighbor it's coming to the house. Come on, they tell him it's coming to my house. Hey, it's coming to my house. There's a blood, huh, there's blood on the doorpost of my house. And I command you, Satan, huh, I push you back. Huh, buckets of blood. Huh, I come against the spirit of compromise. Huh, I come against the spirit of perversion. Huh, my house huh, is a holy house. We gonna cuss in the house uh, and speak in tongues in church. Uh, my house uh, is a house of prayer. Uh, my house uh, is a sanctuary. Uh, my house uh, is a safe place. Uh, pull on your neighbor uh, and said, "Oh neighbor, uh, it's coming uh, to my house. Uh, there's another anointing uh, that's coming uh, to my house. Uh, healing uh, is coming uh, to my house." The spirit of divorce has ran in my bloodline, but I break the back of every spirit of separation and divorce. Somebody get in the high place. My family is a family of healthy marriages. My family is a family of healthy mental people. I come against the spirit a mental illness in my in my blood Lord it is real do it for my house y'all help me pray if this is real if this is real do it for my siblings if your power still works save my children if you still are on the throne deliver my children save my marriage in the name of Jesus buckets of blood buckets of blood pass over land I declare that the spirit of murder will not come nigh my dwelling the spirit of violence and anger will not take residence in my family oh somebody push it back push it back the arrow the arrow the arrow of the Lord's deliverance This ain't how I wanted to preach tonight. Hey, this ain't how I wanted to preach. But I feel like God got a push on me. I feel like he got some on my back. How did I push? I need you to get out of your seat and tell somebody, it's coming to your house. It's coming, my, 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 my. something new, something fresh. Church was never intended to 
be an escape for the saints. That's why some people overcommit, over volunteer. Because they don't want to be at the house. But I hear the Lord say tonight, Dr. Pullins, he's raising up some Abigails. Kat was on the way to Abigail's house because her husband was foolish. That's why I grew up in a generation of saints that every once in a while they're getting a service. When the spirit of heaven is, but come on somebody. He said, God put a burden on you. Mercy, Lord. Mercy, Lord. Mercy, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And God tonight is looking for some Abigail's. God is looking for some Moses that will get between the living and the dead and declare not my family. I refuse to lose another family member to the devil. I refuse to lose another family member to cancer. I refuse to lose another family member to the street. I need somebody in this room to open up your mouth for the men in your family. tonight in part was to frustrate you frustrate you with hope to frustrate you so you don't keep normalizing the dysfunction this is convocation let's have this conversation because maybe what was in front of us won't help it so now we've normalized our dysfunction because we're comparing our lives to other people's dysfunction. But I want you to look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I want to be whole. I want, I want the same victory that I have in church. I want to have it at home. Would you, would you lean over to somebody you know, grab them by the hand, and tell them, I'm not just doing this for me. Tell them, I'm doing this for everybody that got my last night. I'm breaking this for my children. I'm breaking this for my grandchildren. I'm breaking this for the generations that are not even born yet. Why y'all ain't came up in the hot place? Come on. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break it. 
his whole house and God saved his whole house and God saved his whole listen preachers the moment we stop being evangelistic we're no longer part of a movement we have now become a monument when we are okay with coming to church and never praying for the lost and never believing God for the salvation of sinners then we become a country club that will age out what's, what's unbelievable for me is that I had a father that was a, a crack addict all I prayed was for God to save him. And my idea was, Lord, save him if you had to save him on his deathbed. Like, just save him. Have you ever prayed for somebody so long and the situation was so bad that you said, well, God, they ain't got to live long. Okay. So Y'all don't. Yeah, no, I, I get it. If, you, if you've never been there, I hope you don't ever get there. But when you see people that went back and forth, back and forth, you're like, Lord, as soon as they get saved, it's okay if you take them. Save them and take them. No, because when you have to pray because you don't know where they are from moment to moment. And you don't know if they're laying in the street with a needle up their arm. And when I know, when I see what God has done for that man, not only did God save my father, not only did he raise him up in ministry. This last week, I'm talking to him on the phone. He's in missions in Liberia, ministry. God outdid, he outdid my expectations. The Bible says man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God I pray that you are blessed by the message today. And if you want to continue to get more inspirational, motivational, and even more gospel messages, I encourage you to follow our YouTube channel or subscribe to our podcast. And today we want to give you an opportunity to partner what we're doing domestically here at our local church and what we're doing all over the world. There are ways to give. And remember, when you sow, that seed may leave your hand, but it'll never leave your life. The Bible declares to us that when we sow, seeds are connected to harvest. Well, I want you to remember that I know what it feels like to cry until you have no more tears left to cry. But after you finish crying, don't stop. Get up and keep going.